Delighted to have you. Welcome to the Rice Distinguished Lecture. Uh, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here with you looking at this amazing turnout. My name is Antonio Merlot. I am the Dean of the School of Social Sciences. Uh, we started the Nobel Distinguished Rice Lecture in 2014. And uh, you know, it has been an amazing opportunity to bring Nobel laureates on campus and share their wis wisdom with us. And tonight, I mean, it's all you know, very special for all of us to be here listening to our speaker, but it's especially a special occasion for uh, Doyle Arnold, whose uh, vision and support has made uh, this lecture series possible. And so it is my pleasure to introduce Doyle, who will then introduce our speaker for tonight. Uh, and he will you know, let you know uh, the background on, on his uh, uh, interaction with Dr. Sharp. So Doyle is a Rice alum. He graduated in 1970 with a degree in economics. Uh, he then went on and uh, got his MBA from Stanford in 1976. Uh, Doyle is a amazingly dedicated Rai Salam, personal friend, uh, amazing supporter of uh, Rice University. Uh, he's a trustee emeritus of Rice University. He currently serves as the chair of the advisory board for the School of Social Sciences, and he's also on the council of uh, Rice, the Rice Initiative for the Study of Economics, who's uh, uh, the uh, vehicle for this lecture series. So let me introduce you, Doyle Arnold. Well, that was way too much about me. Um, uh, to introduce uh, our speaker tonight, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of history. In 1962, a uh, young professor uh, generalized his PhD thesis from UCLA and submitted it to the Journal of Finance where it was promptly rejected. Um, uh, Wikipedia will tell you that it was because uh, uh, it was deemed to be erroneous, or no, irrelevant, excuse me, irrelevant. Uh, Bill corrected me and said, Wikipedia for me and said it was actually an irrelevant assumption that one of the reviewers didn't like. So he rewrote it, resubmitted it in uh, 1964, and this time uh, different reviewers thought better of it, which was fortunate because in 1990, uh, that paper essentially won the Nobel Prize and set forth the capital asset pricing model. And uh, first version of the Sharpe ratio, was that in the paper uh, that too? Was, that, was that was later. Well, <laughs> earlier. Well, anyway, so th things he's well known for. Um, in uh, moving forward to 1974, uh, something some of you may have heard of called the ERISA Act, the Employment. Employee Retirement Income Security Act was passed, which set forth for the first time a governing law and structure around uh, the fiduciary obligations for running pension plans. And uh, by that time, uh, Professor Sharp was at Stanford Business School, and uh, so was I. And uh, I and a few of my colleagues had the privilege of studying under Bill, took several courses. Uh, three of them are with us tonight. One flew in from Pinehurst, one from San Francisco, and one is local, and shows you what esteem we held uh, Bill, and we had a great little reunion. But our last class from Bill was this seminar course on pension management. Um, that interest continued. In 1996, Bill started a company that uh, advertises like crazy on the radio now called Financial Engines, which attempted, was the first kind of online, available, uh, interactive software for, to help the general public to manage their 401k plans. Uh, he, uh, that company now says it has over 900, excuse me, 9 million uh, customers. Uh, the interest continues. He's, he's uh, published an e-book on the subject. Uh, and uh, tonight he's going to talk to us about uh, the same topic that uh, we first studied under him 40 years ago. Uh, it remains if anything more relevant today. Bill is also uh, an avid music lover and some, sometimes musician and an opera buff. Hence, we're holding 
uh, here, and we, we hope to have him back uh, to hear an opera in a couple of years across the street. So uh, let me uh, please welcome with me uh, Professor William Sharp. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Thank you for coming. Thanks. I'm going to do a little housekeeping here so I can see the slides. Hopefully I won't destroy the electronics. Uh, well, it's a delight to be here. And um, <clears throat> I should tell you, uh, when Doyle and I first spoke, uh, the subject came, well, what do you want me to talk about? And he said, I'd really like you to talk about public pensions. And I said, well, okay. Um, and then I thought, well, I'll expand it to Social Security, public pensions, and defined contribution plans, think 401k. Um, I should tell you, and many of you know, John Locke, many, many years ago, called economics the dismal science. Okay, well, this is going to be the most dismal talk you will hear possibly this year or possibly in your lifetime. I apologize for that, but facts are facts. <clears throat> so what I want to talk about is the extent to which we have collectively financed Social Security, the extent to which we have financed public pensions, and some of the issues surrounding financing retirement pay to ourselves from what I'll call DC plans, such as 401ks. So, so that's the subject, and here we go. Um, I'm going to start with demographics because this is the underlying driver of some of the issues that we're going to be looking at. So let me start with this very busy graph. The uh, top line you'll be happy to know when you look at it is the USA, and the bold line in the original diagram is the world. Um, the worst is Africa, and on it goes. But if you look at the top line, this is basically starting in 1975 and going through whatever it is, which I can't read, but the gray is future, the white is past, and this is the life expectancy at birth. When you're born, what is the mean time till you're likely to die? And as you can see, that has been, first of all, it's better here, and that's good. And the second is that it's been going up and is projected to continue to go up. And that's wonderful, <clears throat> but it's a problem. And it's a problem because we're going to have more and more old people, and old people use up resources, they don't typically produce them, or at least not as much. Uh, here is the second factor, fertility. The vertical axis here is children per woman. And to sustain a population, this has to be somewhere around 2.1 uh, because of mortality, and infant mortality. At 2.0, the population will just sustain itself. Below two, it will decrease. And what you see, the blue, don't worry about the red, that's North America, <clears throat> but the blue is the US, the green is the world, and what you see since 1950 on the left, basically fertility rates have been coming down to actually below two and are expected to remain roughly at the two level. Um, going out to the future in the U.S. And interestingly, the whole world is moving in this direction and moving down to that. So yes, population will be con continue to increase in the world, but not as rapidly. And there'll be some point at which you'll get a, a sort of a steady state. But again, fewer children means there are fewer younger people to support the old people, and they're going to be more old people. And those are the basic demographic drivers of the kinds of problems we're going to be looking at. Uh, this is 1950, the United States. This is what still is called a population pyramid. Uh, each of the bars represents a five-year age interval, zero to five, five to ten. Males are on the left, females are on the right. <coughs> and I've drawn two lines in here, they're hard to see, but the bottom one is basically 
roughly when people start becoming productive uh, and earning a living. And the top is the traditional cutoff for retirement of age 65. So what you see, the middle group are the people who are producing, earning incomes, doing products and services. The bottom group are the children who are free riding. And the top group are the old folks uh, who are free riding, in a sense, that they're not producing uh, as much, at least. And needless to say, I want to be very careful about what I say about people in the top group. Uh, I won't tell you where I am. OK, that was 1950. Here is not 2017. And notice the pyramid doesn't look like a pyramid anymore. And two notable things, there's a little bite out of it, um, that, but, which was basically the Depression. But what you see is fewer children. That comes from the demographics, the fertility rate, and a lot more people over 65. And there are, the little tower here has couple of additional stories from people who are really living a long time. And of course, the population's up now to 326. OK, and now here is the projection for 2051. And the pyramid now is what? The Empire State Building or something. So again, and you see, boy, look at all the people over 65. <clears throat> so we've got to find a way to produce enough in the working years, let me call them, to support a lot of retired years, unless, A, we retire a lot later, or B, we find a way to reduce the longevity. And, and, I, <clears throat> and I, I know some of the drug makers, well, never mind. OK. All right. So there we are. Um, those are sort of the products. And oh, there we go. Oh, this is a terrible graph. I apologize. Um, I've drawn a red arrow in here. That's the US. Um, and what this is is what's called the old age dependency ratio. And it's a little out of date. But what it does is say how many people are over 65 per person 20 to 65, those sort of the traditional lines of demarcation. And at the moment in the US, there are roughly 23 or 24 retirees, I'll just call them for shorthand, per worker. And again, that's, you understand I'm being very broad brush. And the US is projected by these particular projections for that to grow to 40 per 100. So for every. 100 people working, there'll be 40 over 65 who are either working or maybe not working as much or not working at all. And the problem is you're going to have far fewer people in the working age range, traditional working age range, to support people above that traditional range. And the other, each, each bar, each horizontal, each bar is a, a country. And you see that we're you know, better than most, uh, not quite as good as some, <clears throat> but nonetheless, it's not just our problem. Indeed, it's worse elsewhere. Not everywhere, but many other countries. So we're not alone in this issue. Now, um, <clears throat> for those of you who are economics majors from Rice, you can just, you know, look at your phones because you know all this. But for some who perhaps were not, <laughs> Let me just do a little introduction to what's called present values, which economists sling around all the time. And I'm going to make it, I hope, mercifully simple. <clears throat> so let's say you have a dollar, and you invest it somewhere, and a year later you have a dollar and three cents. OK, so we say you've earned 3%, right? Now let's turn that around. If I offer to pay you a dollar and three cents a year from now, that's the future value. What's it worth today? And the answer is you divide by 1.03, and we have an answer in the second row. It's 1. So to convert a future value to a present value, you will do what's called discounting. Uh, and you see it works for 
two years from now, a dollar grows to a dollar three, and then the dollar three grows to a dollar three times a dollar three. And if I offer you a dollar two years from now, you can discount that value by dividing by 1.03 times 1.03 to get a present value. The reason this is important is we're looking at retirement, which involves streams of cash going into, hopefully, savings over the years, and then, rather far out, hopefully, streams of cash coming in. And we need a way to put all those in one metric, and the metric we use is a present value. So we ask, what's the present value of the money that's being saved over the first years, and how does that relate to the present value of the money that will be spent afterwards? So we're going to be doing that, and we're going to be looking at present values. And I will say now, and we'll say more about this, <clears throat> that obviously it depends a whole lot when you're doing that kind of calculation what interest rate you use for the discounting. And I'll say more about that. OK? I'm not going to take a show of hands as to those who are still with me. Uh, but uh, I'm going to assume it's everybody. The other thing to talk about, when you think about the rate of interest that is relevant for such a calculation, is whether it's nominal or real. For example, if I invest $100 and I get 103 a year from now, I have earned a 3% rate of interest, which I will now call a 3% nominal rate of interest. I am most economists. But if during that year there was a 2% inflation in terms of what it cost me to buy groceries, then basically I have invested a bag of groceries, let's think of it, and I've only gotten 1.01 .01 bags back. So the real rate of interest purchasing power return, if you will, is 1%. And it's critically important in many of these discussions that we differentiate between real and nominal rates. So let me show you some real and nominal rates. <clears throat> okay, This graph goes from 2004, roughly, through um, the 1st of March, I think, of this year. I think I added one, one dot a couple of days ago. Um, and on the vertical axis, you see an interest rate here called yield. And this is on government, U.S. government bonds, which we used to at least think were the safest investment around, <laughs> uh, and we'll still hope they are. The top green line is what you read about normally, which is nominal interest rates. I buy a government bond, how much more money do I get? a year, two years, three years from now. The bottom line is the return on an instrument some of you may know about called a TIPS, Treasury Inflation Protected Security. It's basically a government bond in which you put your money in and there is a guaranteed coupon, but every year the amount you get is adjusted to include the effect of inflation. So it basically provides, if you will, a real rate of return. And so if you'll notice, now the nominal yield, on a, this is a 20-year bond, is about 3%. But the real yield is close to, I'm sorry, 20-year bonds I used, is close to 1%. And the presumption is people are assuming that over the next 20 years, inflation will be somewhere in the 2% range. There's some nuances about risk, but I'm not going to go into that. But <clears throat> those are the rates. And the thing you will also notice is both of these have come down a lot since 2004. Sure, they've rattled around a bit, but the general trend has been down. And it's understandable that the nominal rate might come down if we think inflation is going to be less. But the more fundamental question is, why has the real rate, the real rate in terms of buying groceries, become so low? For a 20-year bond, it's less than 1%, and still is yesterday, at least. Um, so that's a bit of a conundrum, and it's, it has a lot to do 
with whether or not we think Social Security, public pensions, and possibly our own personal savings is financially sound. If you can expect to get in purchasing power 2 or 3 percent per year from your investments, you're going to be a lot better off than if you only get 1 percent a year. And so that is, that is very much part of this problem slash situation. Let me see where we are. Okay. All right. So let's go to the case studies, let's call them, <coughs> or the experiments. Social Security. Uh, you all know Social Security, you and your employer put money in, and then at some point, hopefully, a little financial advice here, unsolicited, hopefully fairly late in life, you start taking money out. And, and the money goes to the Social Security Administration, if you will, the U.S. government, and the money comes from them. Okay. Now, uh, I want you to look at the solid blue line because that's the U.S. <clears throat> I'll talk about the other lines in a minute. I'm going to come back to this graph so you don't have to memorize it right now. Uh, on the horizontal axis is pre-retirement earnings relative to the average pre-retirement earnings. So, if, so the, it starts at 0.5. Those people are earning half of the average earnings. One is people earning the average earnings, and it goes all the way to people earning three times. So to the right, people are doing better in terms of earnings. The vertical is what's called the replacement ratio. So for example, let's take an average of one and go up and it says 45. So what does that mean? That means for the person who's earning the average, when you retire, Social Security will pay you 45 percent as much as your paycheck was the year before you retired. Okay, so you've replaced 45 percent of your earnings. Got that? You with me? Okay. And what, you see two things here. First, notice this curve goes down. And most of you know that's because Social Security is by design a progressive system in which it's a great return for people who aren't earning much and it's a rotten return for people who are earning a lot. And there's also a cap and there are other aspects that we won't go into. Um, and for somebody who's earning three times the average, the replacement ratio is around 25 percent. So somewhere you got to get more. Uh, you, you're not going to live in Social Security uh, and even if you're average, it's going to be hard. You're going to need something else. Uh, just briefly, the other lines are different countries. Um, they're all, and notice, you know, we're not widely different. We're somewhere in the middle globally in the social retirement program. Um, you might ask, who's up there at 80, 80 plus percent for everybody? <coughs> uh, it's the Italians, uh, Antonio. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but you have to work to, what, 55 to get it, don't you? I mean, it's, it's tough life in Italy. <laughs> they make great cars, though, I can tell you. I rode over in one. OK. All right, let's go on. Um, all right, now, these are calculations. You, every year, the Social Security Administration, if you will, puts out an annual report. And way back in the back, I think it's page 200 and something, are calculations, and that's what I'm going to show you today. And they are hardly noticed by anybody but desperate economists, but I think they're, they really sum it up and, and do it beautifully. So here is a set of calculations, and let me tell you what this is for. If you take all the people who will start Social Security tomorrow, in other words, people typically who will become 15 or 16 tomorrow and get a Social Security number. So all the people that will enter Social Security starting tomorrow forever, calculation goes to infinity, which is an awesome concept, uh, but it's, it's way out there. So this is basically, if we were to start Social Security tomorrow, de novo, would it work? And in particular, would the present value of all the money that would 
come in from workers be equal to the present value of money that would come go out to workers after they started receiving benefits. Okay? And for it to be sound, those numbers should be about the same. And I, I would say, that's why I said this is a very powerful concept which allows you to look at very complicated things in a relatively simple graph. So these are not my numbers, these are Social Securities. And the left bar is the present value of what recipients would receive in retirement. The light bar is present value of what would they, would pay, they and their employers would pay in. And yes, Virginia, Social Security is balanced in this sense for these people. Now, you know, present values are big. That's $80 trillion, you know, trillion here, trillion there. <clears throat> but, but it works according to these numbers. Now, there's a caveat I'm going to give you in a little bit. For comparison, I've shown in the yellow, that is the federal debt before the tax plan. Um, this was 2016, and the far right one is GDP. So figure debt, GDP, about the same, around 20 trillion. And this graph says Social Security's fine going forward. Caveat to come, okay? <clears throat> so this is for the other folks. This is for everybody who now has a Social Security number. Those of you who are, you and your employees are paying in, those of us who are getting Social Security checks, this is for everybody in the system now. So this says, if tomorrow you said, uh-uh, nobody else gets in, and then it goes, does its thing, okay? And what you see on the left is the present value of what will be taken out, paid to the participants in retirement, some 65 trillion. The next bar has two components. The light green, the vast majority, is what you will be receiving from people who are paying in during that period. And that little, you see the little teeny weeny bar, that blue down at the bottom? That's the vaunted Social Security Lockbox Trust Fund. There's like almost relatively, I mean, a couple of trillion. There's almost nothing there. Okay? And worse yet, the amount that is in and will blue, light blue, will be paid in green is a lot less than the amount that will be paid out. So we have a shortfall of, what is it? About 30 trillion. A year and a half GDP, what the heck. Okay, so that's the first bad news. The first bad news is with these Social Security numbers from the administration, <clears throat> and they've been the same for several years, this is not a, a political issue, there is a huge problem in Social Security being underfunded. That little light blue should be enough to make that second set of bars equal the first set, and it is not by a long sight. And while you're wondering about that, what's in that, it's U.S. government bonds. So whether or not that's really an asset or not, you can argue about, but it's so small, let's not argue. So that's a big problem. Now, I'm almost done with this, Social Security, not with a lecture, you know. <laughs> but, but I said there was a caveat. Here's the caveat. Here are the interest rates that were used in computing these present values year by year, future year by year. For some reason, the real rate that they have assumed is a little negative for a year or two, but then by 2025, they're assuming 2.7% real. You'll recall when we looked at that prior diagram, it is now for a 20 year, and even if you go way out, it's still around 1% real. And this is 2.7. I cannot do the calculation to see what those bars would be, look like if I used 1% rather than 2.7. Uh, but I can tell you that it would be uglier by, by long sight. <clears throat> so even those numbers that I showed you are probably pretty optimistic unless the OASD, Social Security, OAS, that's 
old age survivor's disability insurance, which is the whole uh, administration, which is the whole thing, but OSDI, I think it is, but in any event, my error. Um, but those, even those are, are optimistic. So Social Security, big problem, big problem. Okay, moving right along <laughs> to public pensions. Thank you, Dora. <laughs> uh, these are the pensions paid state workers. Traditionally in government, local government and state government, um, instead of using Social Security, there is what's called a traditional defined benefit pension plan uh, where you pay in, the employer puts the money, or the employer typically in the public. It used to be the, pub the employer paid in Increasingly now in the public, the employer and the employee pay in. But in any event, that money goes into investments. And then when you retire, you get checks that are fixed as a function of your retirement, your salary, et cetera, et cetera. And you get the checks, and typically they're adjusted for inflation. And when you die, your partner gets checks until the partner dies, and then it stops, which is what we used to use for individuals in corporate America, I'll come back to that. So that's sort of the public pension, state and local governments. And here's a cartoon from the Monterey Herald, which is possibly the worst paper in the world. Uh, this is the Monterey County. This was February 10th, when they did an editorial on the California pension situation. <clears throat> and um, unfortunately, they've done two more editorials and used the same cartoon. It's a stupid cartoon, but the idea is pension costs are really biting into state budgets and California city budgets, which is what they're featuring here. So let's look at it. And I've used Texas, and let me tell you, these numbers come from Project at Stanford. This is a, an unpaid commercial uh, called the um, Stanford whatever it's, pension tracker, I guess, is what we call it for the web purposes. So what we try to do is get the numbers for California cities and agencies and for states, and to some extent, state agencies. Um, <clears throat> and so I'm going to show you numbers for Texas, California, and then all. Um, and so let's take a look at this. This is state and local, and, and we don't really have data on local pensions, so we cheat. We use the assets of local pensions, and we sort of scale it up using the, the financials from the state itself. So caveat there. So on the left is the asset value, which is 200, almost 200 billion. This is 2016, which is important because it turns out 2016, back in the interest rate graph, was a period of very low interests. And I'll see, show you why that's important. Any event, assets, a little less than 200 billion. Liabilities as the actuaries who are accountants that don't have the personality. <coughs> uh, actuaries do pensions and things. Um, the actuaries say, well, the liability value, and these are all present values, we're using that same construct, as they do. Uh, is a little less than 300 billion. So that's unfortunate. You know, you, you have less than 200 and you owe close to 300, but you know, 65, 70% funded ratio. And that's what you read in the paper. And when you read about, oh my God, the problems with the Texas pension systems, including Houston, which we could talk about later, uh, are use that green number and the asset. The asset value is clean and pretty much these are stocks and bonds and such, some hedge funds, but that's probably a pretty good number. But the liability number that's being used in, in those scary articles is the green, it's the actuarial number. Now then what is that horrible number to the bar to the right, which is also called a liability value? That's the value of the liabilities if you use a lower discount rate. And here's the argument. These are, iron, hopefully, ironclad guarantees. You're going to pay Sally, who just retired from the Texas state government, a certain amount. You're going to give her increases for cost of living until she dies. 
And in principle, that is rock solid. She's going to get it. So ask an economist, how do you value something in the future that is rock solid? They're going to get it for sure. And I think they would say, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, how about US government bonds? It's a safe asset. It's guaranteed. It's fixed. And in this case, because of the cost of living, you'd probably use TIPS, the real rate. But in any event, the real value of that liability is what that liability would get you. Another way of saying it is, what if you went to Prudential and said, would you please take this over for me? Tell me what kind of check I've got to cut. They would basically value it by asking, well, if we just bought government bonds to match the, the payments, what would it cost? So you really ought to value these things at government bond rates. Treasuries, if you include the inflation kicker and the actuarial calculation, tips if you just look at the real. When you do that for Texas in 2016, the liability value is over 600. Now, I, I mentioned before 2016, and this was probably as of June, end of June, was very low interest rates. And the way we did this, Texas, the actuaries are discounting at 8%, 8.0%. And that was a period when government bonds were 2.0%. So for this calculation in this, in this, on the site, we used 2%, as I've shown you there. Um, fortunately, when we do 2017, which will be when the data are available later this year, we'll probably discount at something closer to 3 But there'll still be a huge disparity. Okay? So let me just play that out a little bit more without belaboring it by pressing the right button. Thank you, Bill. <clears throat> so this is our estimate for the entire US. On the actuarial basis, the unfunded liabilities for state and local governments are about one and a half trillion, which translates to a little over 11 and a half, a little under 11 and a half thousand dollars per household. We have all kinds of metrics, but per household is, is a, a good, simple one. When you look at the market value, at least in this year, that unfunded liability grows to over six and a half trillion, or fifty-two and a half thousand dollars per household. So this is a debt which, in effect, we have, we households, because Somebody's going to have to pay it, and in principle, it would be us, and it's large. Uh, one last graph, I hope, in this section. <laughs> Here's our map of the U.S. Uh, you see Texas down there. Texas uh, is number 26, 28, I think 26. So that's the good news for those of you from Texas. Uh, my state, California, uh, is not the number one in the country, but we're pretty close. We're number two uh, in liability per household, 122,000. Not a pretty picture. And if you go to the site, you can get the map, and you can get a zillion different metrics for your state, for another state, um, for the US. So I commend pensiontracker.org to you. There's a California site and a US site. But again, the problem is very, very dire. And don't blame me for this. You can blame me for the Social Security problem. You blame Doyle for this problem. OK. OK, on happier note, we're going to look at what you do, in some sense, voluntarily, if you're in a defined contribution plan. You may have one at a university through TIA CREF. You may have one at your workplace um, <clears throat> where you and your employer put aside money and invest. And when you retire, you have a lump sum that you can convert to an annuity or, or whatever. We'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, here's a cartoon from The New Yorker. For those in the back, it says, Grandpa, tell us again about pensions. This was from last November. Because in the old days, People at General Motors had the same kind of pension that people 
that the state of Texas have. And they didn't even put in. They just worked. Retired, they got a check. They died, the partner got a check. The partner died, the check stopped. What was defined in the plan was the benefit you get. And increasingly, those plans are going the way of the dodo. Corporations and employers, private employees that have them, um, have either stopped them or <coughs> um, frozen them to new employees. And many of them have basically gone to an insurance company and said, look, you take this over, please. Um, so rightly or wrongly, we are in the world of voluntary retirement savings. You decide what you put in. The employer hopefully will match at least some of what you put in, which is free money. Um, and then hopefully you're going to have enough money when you retire. So let's look at that a little bit. This is the graph we saw before, the replacement rates from Social Security. And I'm going to assume that you have Social Security and then ask how much would, do you need to have in addition in money when you retire to basically supplement the Social Security and give you, a, you know, a reasonable retirement income. And this is very complicated and please don't anybody just rely on calculations like this. You need to take into account all kinds of aspects of your home situation. You may need to make a lot of complicated decisions. I'm just trying to get a, a really rough sense here <clears throat> of whether or not individuals and families in this country are prepared via the defined contribution plans to supplement Social Security. And I'm going to assume that Social Security is going to come through in full, present rules, which is probably a stretch. Okay? Okay, so I did, this is a very simple calculation. You know, let's take one there. For somebody with an average earnings, Social Security is going to replace about 45% of their final income. And if they want to get to 80% of their final income, which is, I'm assuming is, is, is sort of what's needed in retirement, not as much as you earned when you were working because you don't have to dress up and you, know, you probably don't want to travel as much or maybe you can't. So I'm doing an 80% total. Some say 85, but I'm using 80. Um, and you need to replace 35% of your final income through your savings however they, from where, hence they may have come. So this could be 401k plan, this could be savings out on your own, independent of your employer. This could be, and for most people, is net worth equity in your home. For many working people, their greatest asset at retirement is home equity, which you can presumably borrow on with a mortgage or a reverse mortgage. But somewhere you need a net worth at retirement, and the question is how much. Um, don't read this, it's a bore. <clears throat> but um, I, I wanted to use a public source, and I, Fidelity has something that you can get to without being a, a client. And basically this says, if you're 67 um, and you want a dollar a year, increasing at 2% a year, hopefully to cover inflation, so roughly constant real income, you're going to need about $18, $19 in net worth to buy an annuity that will provide that to you. And if you don't buy an annuity, in a sense, you need more because you may have to worry about living a really long time. So this is probably a calculation worth making whether you're going to buy an annuity or not. Okay, and so doing that, you get the following numbers. So for somebody with an average earnings, that's a one on the horizontal axis, it says you need about six and a half times your final income in net worth. Okay, to get an 80% replacement ratio. And because Social Security is progressive, if you're earning three times the average and you want to replace 80% of that income, you're going to need 10 times your final income and net worth. Okay. 
Um, I'm trying to read eyes, but I'm not having much success. I can't, I'm not seeing any, oh my God, no. <laughs> I don't know, does that seem like a lot or, or too little? I think most people think it's a lot, but, uh, and maybe it is a lot, but there it is. Okay, I think I have, I have two slides, and, and it's, 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 uh, I was not very successful in getting good, clean data answering the question, well, how much do people really have? How prepared are people? Here's one cut. <clears throat> this is 2016 net worth as a percent of disposable income. So the red is the U.S., and it says the, across the entire economy, the average is around close to six times. So putting everybody in, you get net worth of about six times pre-retirement income. You know, which is pretty good. But as I'm sure you've all figured out, well, there are some folks in there that got a whole lot of net worth. <laughs> and there are folks in there that have a, a little, and I'm not sure where I am. You probably aren't sure, or where you will be. Um, but that's at least encouraging in the aggregate. But I told you it was dismal. Here is as of 2015, and the, I put a red marker around the, the 55 to 64 range, so these are people getting close to retirement. And the dark green says that's 40% of those people have at least four times income in net worth. Uh, we don't know how many of them have six, how many of them eight, how many of them have 10. Uh, but what we know is 60% of the people have less than four, which is kind of scary. I think I have one more. Here's another one I found, and again, I put red bars around. 70% of the people have less than eight times their final income saved. And what is it? 62% uh, yeah, have less than six times. I added the numbers to the bars, but. Um, so, you guys have got to do better. You're going to have to save more. I'm sorry to tell you that. And that's all predicated on, for the public employees, the public pensions making good on the terms as they are now. We're already beginning to see, I know in Texas, in Houston, there's been a cutback in some benefits. Uh, there's litigation in the Supreme Court in California on what's called the California Rule, which says you can't do that. Um, and so, as a result, uh, if in fact there's going to be less from Social Security, maybe not for some of you that are closer to my generation, but for some of you who are students now, uh, polls show that if you ask millennials what they expect to get from Social Security, the median answer is zero. Um, so at least there's an, there's an understanding there's a problem. Okay. I sound like, I sound like my New England forebears. Well, you need to say it more. You can't spend that much, but I'm afraid that's what it says. Okay, so I went to the Fidelity site again a couple of days ago or last week and got this absolutely cunning little interactive tool which you can use. I have no notion what assumptions are behind it, <clears throat> but it said, what is your age? And I said, I'm 25. On the internet, everyone's a dog. Okay. And it said, um, choose the age you want, want to re you want to retire, the little person with the clock, and I said 67. And then it, there's this bizarre little question with a, this little person with a golf club. What is what does it say? Can you read it? Uh, what lifestyle do you want in retirement? And I chose average. You can choose below average or above average. <laughs> and then it'll tell you how much you need to save as a percent of your proportion of your net worth. They want you to end up, in this case, at 10. But of course, they have an incentive to have you save more. So this may not be an unbiased set of forecasts. And it'll tell you at each age where you ought to be. So. Um, I said it was free and you get what you pay for, but okay, I'm done. <laughs> Questions? Thank you. Who's doing it? 
Antonio either left because he was bored or because he's going to do something now. He's going to do something now. So the way we're going to run the question and answer, I ask people who would like to ask questions to actually line up on this side. And then uh, uh, you can ask your question. And you know, he's going to uh, you know, address the, the answer with the audience. Unfortunately, we don't have a microphone that we can pass around. Uh, so we are going to do it this way. But also, before we start with the question and answer, let me remind everybody that everybody's invited to a reception following this event. And the reception is going to be held in the Dory Common in uh, Baker Hall. So it's a short uh, uh, walk outside of uh, Studio Hall toward the uh, Terrell Center. Uh, so if you, know, you, you would like to ask a question, uh, I ask that. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, okay. yes, that's, okay. that's right. Yeah, exactly. I can repeat it. When we look at equity rules, those were consistent rules over a very long period of time. They were gigantic today, very predictable. Short periods of time, not predictable. Argued for using fixed income for cash flows that are coming in soon and minimum maintenance and lots of equity so those cash flows aren't going to happen for 15, 20, 30, 40 years. How does that, how does that get factored in with using a 2% Okay, the, the question, and tell me if I misstate, is <clears throat> in the long run, certainly historically, equities have done much better than bonds. And so <clears throat> the question is why, now I'm, I'm shortening it a bit, there are two issues, how you should invest, whether you should invest your money, 401k in equities or bonds. I'm going to skip that um, because that's a long, long answer. But the second part is how do I justify and how do others Economists justify discounting at two or or three percent of bond rates. Discount at a bond rate, when in fact, if you put your money in equities and it's really a forty or fifty year investment, the odds are very very good that you will end up with more money. Is that is that a fair? Okay. And and this is, and believe me, this is an argue, a, a discussion you have with actuaries. And I should tell you. The actuaries who do state and local finance um, are a member of one organization that strongly advocates discounting at seven and a half or eight or seven percent equity rates, if you will, or equity bond mix rates. The actuaries who do private corporate plans tend to discount at something closer to bond rates. So there's a huge divide in the actuarial community, which perhaps strangely depends on, well, in the case of the actuaries who work for corporations, the IRS has a, has a hand in this too. But if you look at, say, the General Motors accounts for pensions, uh, they would be, to the extent they even have a defined benefit anymore, would be discounted at the rates, bond rates, or at, if you will, what it would cost you to defease by having an insurance company take it over, because that's pretty much the same. Insurance company, when they price it, when they take it over, will use bond rates. So the question is, why don't we? Why do we economists, at least, and I'll, myself and my friends, and I've been advocating this since the 80s, so this is not new for me. Um, why do we argue you ought to value a guaranteed fixed future commitment at bond rates? And if it's really guaranteed government bond rates. And the answer is, you know, that's what it's worth on the marketplace. Now, yes, you could take the money and put it in equities, and there is some probability distribution of what you would have. By the way, the typical pension now in the public sector, on average, the cash flow is only about 13 years out. It's not 40 or 50 years, the so-called duration when you adjust everything is about 13 years. So these aren't, these aren't way out there. Um, so in 13 years, you could lose a lot of money on equities, as you know, some public pension funds have, have demonstrated. Um, I mean, it depends, obviously, on which 13 years. But the argument is simply, if it's an ironclad guarantee, you're gonna, it's going to be paid for sure. You just ask, what does that go for out there in the marketplace? And the answer is it goes for bond rates. 
And that's, that's basically it. And yes, it, you, it's fine. If, if you want to do calculations as to what you might have if you put the money in, say, a typical public portfolio of bonds and stocks and private equity and hedge funds and whatever, you can do that. You're going to get it, but you better get a probability distribution, not a number. <laughs> and, uh, and that's the probability distribution of what you might have 13 years from now. But the value of what you've promised, most economists, I believe, I, I think I know, would argue you use the bond rates. Um, just to show you how complicated this is, uh, this group at Stanford had a press day. So we got a bunch of press people in from hither and yon, and we spent an entire day, you know, lectures and slides and this and that and all, and <clears throat> uh, trying to make among mainly this point that we, I just tried to make. And within a week, there was a program on, a business program on the local, um, I think it was CBS TV outlet, which they said, the people at Stanford think you're going to earn 3% on the pension fund assets. No, <laughs> that's not what we said. Uh, so it's a difficult point. And again, I, I don't, I'm not saying anything about how you should invest the money if you are running the pension. But recognize that you have some chance, it may be small, of not making it, you know, even though you had the money that would cover the 3%. So. Sorry, I promised not to go on quite so long next time. Yes? Well, I, I, I'll, I'll try, try to do it. Good. For all the young people in this, how do you recommend paying for retirement? <laughs> <laughs> Question is, for young people, how would you recommend planning for retirement? Very carefully. <laughs> um, well, there are all kinds of, of tools out there. There are some that are on the internet, some of which are good, some of which are not so good. But basically, you can play around with, well, if I put this much aside and my income goes up by that much, there's simulators, Monte Carlo simulators. And in the Monte Carlo means you've got uncertainty in there, so you generate a lot of scenarios. The work that uh, Doyle re referred to, the, the software I've got on, on the site that you can have, um, generates 100,000 possible scenarios for future years. It's more designed for the post-retirement period, but you can do it for the pre-retirement period. I'll put in this much, and then I'll put in that much, and I'll invest in this, and I'll invest in that, and then with some sort of model as to the range of returns you might get on equities, on bonds, you get a range of how much money you would have at that, when you retire, what your net worth would be relative to your income. And then you can also do simulations of what, if I put that money in this or that or the other thing. So you need to deal with uncertainty. There's no way out. You know, um, and anybody who says you can just do a simple little calculation, just, just don't pay any attention to them. And unless you invest in government bonds, and you match all, everything to the cash flows, there's going to be uncertainty. And you need to hire some really good economists from Rice who can help you with that. <laughs> or become one. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I'm glad you asked that. The question is, how does immigration affect the population pyramids? I don't know what the assumptions are in the Social Security numbers. Um, <clears throat> and I don't know what, you know, and those population pyramids come from, I think, the Bureau of the Census for the U.S. Uh, the U.N. also makes projections of pyramids. You can get them online, say population pyramid. Um, but my Assumption is that they assume some level of immigration. Uh, that raises the more important point about the effect of immigrants on the pyramids and therefore on the feasibility, financial feasibility of these systems. And to be perfectly frank, immigrants are a hell of a deal uh, because they come in right at the point where they're likely to earn some money and produce goods and services 
And if you're lucky, they're illegal, so they have to pay into Social Security and they don't get anything out. <laughs> now there's a deal. <laughs> Not so much of a deal for the immigrants. So, so immigration, and as I'm sure you know, the countries where this is a huge problem demographically, uh, Germany, a lot of the European countries, I mean, well, you know, Germany desperately needed, wanted, and took in immigrants in the last two or three years, in large part because of just that demographics. Certainly. Carrie. Very boy, yeah. Carrie is one of my very best students ever, and she's saying nice things about me. That's my, okay, all right. Now, question. True. So going forward is when the, the rents, I mean, there's, there's, there's mm -hmm. but it looks like it's going to drop. And so we won't be able to get that rebate in, in the vacation area. And I know for sure that vendors like Fidelity love to arbitrate the payment plans because it's the call it free money. I mean, I heard that from their mouth. Mm -hmm. Okay, there, there, there are a lot of things in the question. Let me, let me summarize, if I may. Uh, in a lot of 401k plans, typically the employer provides some options for you in which you can invest your money. One or more of the, the options, an equity fund, a bond fund, a, you know, a short-term fund, et cetera. But a very popular, as Carrie says, an increasingly popular fund, it's called a target date. Uh, it's produced by Fidelity or Vanguard or somebody, and basically, there's a target date if you were born in a given year, and it starts you off with equities, and then as you get older, it changes the mix to more bonds, less and less equities, et cetera. And so it's, it's targeted at your age, because then they know roughly when they can figure out you'll retire. And Carrie's point is that there are periods in which bonds do better, and tell me if I'm oversimplifying, and there are periods in which equities do better. And as was said earlier, over the long run, equities certainly have done better. So I think if I can rephrase your question is, uh, well, well, it's certainly the point of fact, as Kerry said, uh, investment managers love target date funds. Um, they can charge a little more and uh, et cetera. Um, and the question is, and it's very easy for a participant. I'm 35, here's the target date for him. If somebody's 35, bang, I'm done. And the question is, is this likely to be the best possible outcome? Um, and I think, again, the answer is it depends on you, the employee. And in an ideal world, you would at least be exposed to some information as to the range of things that might happen to you when you retire depending on whether you use this target date or an equity fund or a bond fund or a 50-50 all the way through to retirement. And, and to be perfectly frank, financial engines with which I'm not associated at all anymore, I'm retired, but you know, tries to do that as do many others. Vanguard has, you know, there, there are many services that can help you with that. So ideally there would be an, enough information exchanged from the advisory service, let's call it, to the employee, for the employee to make an informed decision. But it's, and the idea that there's one size that fits all doesn't make much sense, we're different. Some are risk averse, some are really risk averse. So it, it, it's good if the employee can get at least some vague sense of, if I do this, here's the range of outcomes. If I do that, here's the range of outcomes. And make an informed decision. But it's not easy. Yes, sir. Tell, I'm, I'll go on forever. <laughs> yeah, it's only four. Hell, it's only four fifteen. I'm from California. <laughs> First, I won't pass along your comments to my uh, wife's cousin, who's an actuary. 
<laughs> oh, I bet she has more actuary jokes than I do. Well, <laughs> I have some good ones. So. Um, Okay, the question, I'll just FICA, it's an acronym, but the question is, if in fact, as you probably know, Social Security, you pay a given percentage of your salary, you pay six and a quarter, the employer pays six and a quarter now, um, and you only pay up to, I don't know, what is it, 125000 whoever, a year, up to some level of salary, you know, that money goes, what is it? Say again. 128.4, okay, thank you. Um, and then above that, you don't pay in, and of course, in a sense, you don't get out. But, uh, and the question is, if we just said, well, everybody has to pay six and a quarter, no matter what you earn, and the employer has to pay six and a quarter, no matter what. And there are calculations, some done, I believe, in Social Security, and a thousand academics have, are doing those calculations probably as we speak. I mean, the, the, many people have addressed the question, how do we, how do we fix or at least put a band, some sort of a tourniquet or something on Social Security? And that's one suggestion uh, to basically cap what you get out if you earn a lot, but not cap what you put in if you earn a lot. So it's very progressive, at least those proposals. And you know, there's lots of modeling out there for different, different schemes. Yes? Okay, mm-hmm. Okay, yes, yeah, the question has to do with what's called the claiming age for Social Security. When do you tell Social Security, okay, I want to start drawing benefits? And without going into all the actuarial mumbo jumbo, um, the sooner you start, age 62, let's say, the less you get per year. But of course, you have more years till you die, whenever that may be. <clears throat> and there are calculations available online for that too. You can do the trade-offs. It's incredibly complicated because Social Security pays widows or widowers, and it pays, you know, non-adult children if you die. I mean, there, you know, there. Are, somebody once said there are 200,000 combinations uh, in trying to make that decision. Sort of the simple bottom line is one of you, uh, because of the spousal benefits, uh, should probably wait to 70 which is the age at which you get the max per year. I'm not advocating this, I'm just saying, if you look around. And, um, and the other one maybe wants to start earlier, but most people should at least wait these days to 67. There's, there's a normal retirement age and adjustments below it, and et cetera. It's very complicated. There are tools online for that. Financial Engines, I believe, has a free one that you could find. I don't know enough about the innards to tell you whether it's wonderful or not, but. I hope it's wonderful. <laughs> okay, that's a, how, how long do you folks have? <clears throat> um, uh, let's say probably a week or so. Uh, well, the two questions, the sharp ratio, sharp ratio is the simplest and and, and I might say dumbest measure you can think of to take risk and return into account. It's a very, it's just the simplest idea in the world. You take on the numerator, it's a ratio, so the numerator is how much you, better you've done than if you put your money in treasuries. And on the bottom is how much variability there was month to month, let's say, as you, you know, over that period of time. So, Reward, I used to call it the reward to variability ratio. Reward in the top, that's good. Variability in the bottom, that's bad. 
and the question is how much reward do you get per unit of variability. Uh, it was designed for a total portfolio, not for a particular holding in a portfolio. And, you know, and my, my simple answer is, good God, we've got computers now. You don't have to just do that. <clears throat> but that said, it's, it's useful, um, as long as you know its limitations. And there are variants of it where you say, well, let's compare with, instead of treasury bills, which the Sharpe ratio does, let's compare it with an index fund you know, if I've got a growth stock fund, let's compare it with the returns on a growth stock fund. So you say, on average, how much better did I do and how much variation was there over the course of time? So there's a whole strand of things. But, but I mean, we have so much more sophistication and the ability to do so many computations now. That's, that's, that's a very, very rough place to start. It's, not, it's better than not taking risk into account at all. I will certainly say that. But again, it's, it's pretty primitive. And, and I did not call it the Sharpe ratio. I called it the reward to variability ratio. Somebody else called it the Sharpe ratio. <laughs> but it's OK. <laughs> OK, I think we're done. Thank you so very much. Thank you. So again, you're all welcome to join us and join Professor Sharp for the reception. Uh, in Dory Common on Baker Hall, on the ground floor of Baker Hall. Thank you all for coming.